Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Kristen Mills and I'm a project manager within Ecolab's Hand Hygiene Group. Today I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, Dr. Ben Chapman. Ben is an associate professor and food safety extension specialist at North Carolina State University. As a teenager, a Saturday afternoon viewing of the classic cable movie outbreak sparked his interest in pathogens and public health. With the goal of less foodborne illness, his group designs, implements, and evaluates food safety strategies, messages, and media from farm to fork. Through reality-based research, Ben investigates behavior and creates interventions aimed at amateur and professional food handlers, managers, and organizational decision makers, the gatekeepers of safe food. Ben co-hosts a bi-weekly podcast called Food Safety Talk and tries to further engage folks online through Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and maybe not surprisingly, Pinterest. Please welcome Ben Chapman. Great. Thank you so much for work. Uh, the introduction and for hosting me today. Uh, I am sitting in the comfiness of my own home uh, as here in Raleigh, North Carolina, we received about an inch worth of sleep last night. So my uh, my children are, are home. So uh, hopefully uh, we don't have any extra special guests uh, that join us today on the webinar. Um, but I am, uh, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this today and, and happy that um, that I was asked to talk about um, hand washing, and and not not so much from a, um, a a standpoint of you know what are the components of hand washing, but but really to delve a little bit into some of the issues that we see around uh, the area of hand washing and some of the the past problems that that we've seen. Um, a, a lot of what what I've done in the last I guess 10 years or so has revolved around food safety behaviors, and hand washing is, is one of those where consist, consistently we can show that there is a perception that it is, it, it is important, and we can consistently show that food handlers have the knowledge on how and when to wash hands, but for a variety of reasons, and, and I'm going to get to that over the next 30 minutes or so, for whatever reason, uh, it, it's not something that is done very well um, uh, compliance-wise uh, across across the board. And and that, as, as a researcher, that's extremely interesting to me because, um, you know, so often we, uh, we, we focus a, a lot of our – efforts on, on training and knowledge, and, and here's one, if not the most um, ex exemplary behavior where um, we have not really been able to, uh, to move the needle so much uh, with lots and lots of resources in education. So it, to me, it, it, and, and as, as I go through things over the next little while, um, I think it's, it's got more to do with other aspects and other factors as opposed to uh, strictly um, education. And, and really that's why I chose the, um, the title slide here uh, of the uh, e-card of not only can people hear you go to the restroom, but they can also hear that you didn't wash your hands because there is some aspect um, that we have seen in the literature to peer influence and um, an area that, that I know many of you have, have probably looked at in, in your own firms and organizations around food safety culture. Uh, around around hand washing specifically. So let's uh, start things off here by um, getting, I guess, some of my, my biases out uh, early on. And let's talk about hand washing signs. Um, here's probably my, my most favorite hand washing sign um, that, that I've seen. Uh, this is from a a, a bar in uh, downtown Raleigh, and um, if you're having trouble, I will read it. It says, an effort to prevent illness and to control the spread of disease, the laws of the great state of North Carolina and common decency require that all employees wash both hands with soap and water after using this or any other bathroom. If any employee is not available, we really, really encourage you to wash our own hands, please. Um, I, I gave a, a, a talk uh, maybe four or five years ago at the uh, GFSI uh, Consumer Conference and uh, talking about some of the work that I had done on um, 
posting up narratives and telling stories around hand washing and compliance. And um, after that that talk, I had a um, someone who was a you know, vice president for food safety at a European grocery chain uh, come up to me afterwards and said, "So, so you're telling us that." Hand washing signs, we should take them all down because they don't encourage people to actually do anything. And I, my answer to that question was hand washing signs serve a purpose, although if we're using them to um, get people to change their behaviors, they probably only work the first day that you put them up, or if you find it really humorous and, and you tell people about it, like with this one. But hand washing signs right now are really a regulatory requirement. We need to do a lot of other different things and take some different strategies to really impact hand washing. Um, putting up a hand washing sign really, uh, while well, it is what what the the law requires, and it's something that um, you know that, that that seems like a, a good idea, may or may not do anything at all. And in fact, I would, I would focus on the, it probably doesn't do a whole lot. So what, what can we do? And I'm going to uh, talk about that as, as we go along today. Um, another, I guess, good way to start, and I, I think anytime I talk about hand washing for probably in the next four or five years, I'll have to use this slide um, as well. But another uh, interesting thing that's popped up in the world of hand washing in the last uh, two weeks was um, a senator from, from my state, the great state of North Carolina, um, Tom Tillis, who uh, in comments about regulation um, made, a, made a comment um, that I'll paraphrase here, basically saying maybe we overregulate the restaurant industry, maybe we overregulate food service, and let's look at hand washing as an example of a place where we, we may want to allow um, – businesses to opt out of hand washing um, as, as a requirement. And we'll let the, the free market dictate um, whether people want to eat there. Uh, we'll take the one regulation of making people wash their hands after certain uh, activities and replace it with another regulation of you'll have to post a sign uh, or put a disclaimer like the one that, that I made um, here that says, note your food was made without the benefit of hand washing. It may contain traces of... Uh, feces. Um, and in one, one sense, this, you know, it made my job and probably what you do um, extremely relevant for about two days, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, on a national scale. Uh, and, it, you know, as, as, as kind of, I guess, silly as, as the argument is, it, it does come with uh, a sense of uh, what are the risks associated with hand washing. And, um, what really, you know, getting into sort of a an academic discussion about it, what really would I want to know if I was a restaurant patron um, knowing, and, and I'll show you some stats on this as we go along, knowing the compliance overall in our, in our food industry when it comes to hand washing isn't fantastic already, but is it the act of hand washing that, that matters, or will we be interested in other things like, employee health policies, um, whether someone washed their hands is, is important, um, clearly, but I really want to know whether someone washed their hands after they had, um, after they went to the restroom or after they handled some raw food. And um, I really want to know whether an employee was allowed to work while ill, um, regardless of, of their hand washing ability. And, but, but it was, you know, it was kind of this interesting discussion around um, hand washing. And I, I think, fortunately for us in, in our jobs and in, in folks that are protecting businesses, protecting public health from food safety incidents, um, it was one that, that made this national, um, this national headline that uh, there was clearly this um, customer, consumer driven response of, oh, my gosh, of course I want to eat at restaurants where people wash their hands. And had I been running a, a restaurant, had I been uh, working in um, uh, a food business, I probably, instead of, you know, going back a slide to um, my hand-washing sign here, I probably would have maybe put a picture up in my employee restroom 
of Senator Tillis saying, this guy doesn't think that you need to wash your hands, but I do. Or um, we don't wash our hands because you know, the law says that we do. We do it because we, we want to protect our consumers. We want to protect our patrons. I would have used that incident, that event, as a driver because it already grabbed some sort of national discussion. Um, in you know, I, I, uh, we, I run this blog that some of you might know um, with a colleague. It's uh, called Bark Blog. And because of that, uh, there's a few people that, that I know socially um, that I play hockey with that, um, that kind of know what I do. And, gosh, as soon as that happened, that this kill thing happened, um, everyone wanted to talk about hand washing, even just people that, that were, you know, sort of on the street and sort of in, knew a little bit about what I did. But I, I guess the, the point here is incidents like this pop up, and it's important when it comes to uh, trying to capture your audience, which uh, ultimately I think are the food handlers that you support, that, that work for your companies, that work for your organization. Um, it's good to capture their attention when it's at the attention nationally. So what what else is kind of going on in the world of hand washing? Well, there's a, a fairly um, substantial outbreak of hepatitis A going on in Australia right now linked to uh, frozen berries. And, and we in the U.S. had a similar uh, incident uh, about uh, 18 months ago um, where uh, frozen berries have been linked to uh, hepatitis A. In this case, and, and who knows what the information really looks like, but the investigative journalism and the discussion um, publicly and, and media-wise is pointing towards two things. One, the fact that the berries were likely imported from uh, from China, from you know a foreign country, from uh, from Australia, and two, that hygiene standards with Chinese workers um, may not be as high as what is expected in, in Australia. And lo and behold, here's the headline that, that came up, uh, as you can see, February 17th, um, so today uh, in, in Australia, that says poor hygiene amongst Chinese workers could have been the cause of hepatitis A outbreak through Nana's frozen berries. And hand washing, again, is at the forefront uh, of uh, you know of, of a discussion out there around an outbreak, and who knows? I mean, this is kind of the situation. We none of us really know what the specific factors are until we see the outbreak reports, until we see um, the investigation documents, until the, our public health partners are out there and and are really looking at historically what has been a problem. Um, you know, who knows? Maybe this is an irrigation water. Or, or frost protection water issue. I mean, it's un unclear at this point. But hand washing is brought up because of this concern about it's something that, that someone can see. Uh, and, and there is uh, in, in the berry um, industry, because of the, you know, how berries are, uh, um, are handled, they're, they're often picked with bare hands. So let's move on a little bit into why does hand washing matter? And what are we trying to do? In a hand washing event, what are the behaviors that we're trying to, um, uh, to to accomplish, and why? So, there are really two big sources of pathogens on hands, um, and I alluded to this with the Tillis comments. There's there's this idea that someone who goes to the restroom, a food handler goes to the restroom and has, um, uh, you know, does I guess two of three things that people might do in the restroom, or there are probably other things, but two things that matter the most when it comes to hand washing and pathogens is have a bowel movement or vomit. And the toilet is a, a source of certain pathogens on hands. If you look at hepatitis A, norovirus, Shigella, uh, Giardia, sometimes Salmonella, um, that, that event of going to the restroom um, and depositing something um, through a bowel movement or, or vomit really increases the likelihood that pathogens are going to get out, end up on the hands. Um, so, in that, you, we, we know from the literature that, that human feces, if someone is uh, a carrier of a pathogen or is ill, that gra uh, one gram of human feces can carry up to 10 to the 7 pathogens uh, per, you know, per gram. It's, it's a, a sizable amount. We switch over to food. Um, you see a little different type of pathogen, salmonella, E. coli, campylobacter, vibrio. Um, these pathogens are in much lower prevalence comparatively to, to human feces. And at the most, 
in a, in a contaminated food, um, you would maybe see somewhere around 20,000 pathogens per milliliter of, of, of juice, of liquid, of water uh, that's on the outside of that, um, that uh, product or something that's been rinsed off of it. I include a picture here of, of onions and carrots because we did have an outbreak um, about three years ago in the U.K., uh, that was an E. coli 15787 outbreak that investigators actually found that preparation of raw onions and carrots in a kitchen were um, the biggest risk factors that, that came out in the epidemiology. And it was estimated that poor hand washing after handling those uh, products, uh, as well as cross contamination in the kitchen, were, were likely factors, which is, um, you know, I guess somewhat surprising. Uh, for for many, because we don't think of those those types of you know fresh produce as as a source of contamination to hands, but in this case it, it was. Um, so why else is hand washing important? Well, CDC says that 89% of outbreaks caused by contamination from food handling, the pathogens were transferred by a worker's hands. Um, so again, it's either from the toilet uh, or uh, or, or from uh, from a food, and, and I would include in that toilet um, situation, door handles, faucets, you know, things like that. Um, and if we look at, um, you know, just prevalence, we have around a million cases of salmonella a year. Uh, it is sometimes, in, it, depending on the on the year, but it is sometimes associated with, uh, with food handlers, and I'll give you a little more on that in a second. Uh, but then, really, if we look at our foodborne viruses and norovirus specifically, we see somewhere around 20 million cases of norovirus a year. About 5 million of those cases are estimated to be coming from foodborne illness, um, and, and especially in a restaurant setting. Um, just another example uh, of hand washing importance. Uh, we had a situation in New Jersey uh, right at the start of, of this year. Uh, where an ill food handler uh, was at a, a restaurant, uh, Rosa's Restaurant and Catering. Um, after that ill food handler was uh, was identified, and, you know, through through Bark Blog, we probably see oh about one issue a week in the U.S. where um, where someone uh, is a food handler is identified or a server. We actually have a last night a server in, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, identified as uh, as ill with hepatitis A, and then uh, public health clinics happen for IgG shots. Uh, you know, afterwards, because you know, within a two-week window, those shots matter. Um, in this case, it was it was a, a unique situation that I, that I had not seen before, where a food handler was identified. There have been three post-exposure cases. All three of those cases were individuals who didn't take the vaccination warning seriously, so they knew they had been exposed to the virus through a food handler, um, and did not go get that, that protective protective shot, but pre-outbreak uh, uh, inspection results demonstrated that Rose's restaurant had been cited multiple times with hand washing violations, and clearly in this situation, the only way that those three individuals um, picked up that virus, or, the, or I shouldn't say the only way, the most likely way that they picked up that virus was a poor hand washing um, behavior set from the individual who, uh, who was ill. And then and then it wasn't prevented because they didn't uh, go ahead and get the shots. But still, the introduction of the virus to them was through that, that poor food handler. Um, we've also seen not just on, you know, food service type uh, situations, but this is one especially for those who work with baked goods, a really interesting outbreak uh, that happened that was traced to hand washing in Japan in uh, 2013. And over a thousand children at uh, multiple schools in Japan were linked to were, were um, identified with having norovirus. The common food in all these uh, um, the common food in all of the um, schools was bread that was produced by a, a baker, Hofuku. And uh, during the investigation, uh, the public health release, hand washing issues were found. Uh, repeated violations within the bakery firm. And um, the human norovirus with the same genome was uh, was isolated from the restroom, and so just a, a a really interesting, you know, unique kind of situation where it's a type of food that we would not consider in food service. You know, a, it's not a potentially hazardous food. Doesn't not a food that requires non-temperature uh, for control, uh, you know, for safety. 
Um, but uh, but it could absolutely, and in fact, this uh, uh, yeah, outbreak was the vehicle for norovirus, and poor hand washing was at the at the uh, heart of it. Um, you know, we we know that there's a, a around 48 million cases of foodborne illness every year in the U.S. The pie chart that you see on this slide is uh, comes from a, a paper that focuses you know, on norovirus and foodborne viruses, where 62% of the foodborne cases of, of uh, norovirus have been associated with restaurants and eating in the restaurants. And you see other different types of uh, facilities, catering, private homes, banquets, but 62% of those uh, those outbreaks that were investigated were, were linked to restaurants. So, and, and um, you know, we know cleaning up vomit is, is one of the things that we have to worry about, but hand washing and where those virus particles move is uh, is kind of enormous. And it's not just ill food handlers. Um, some of the really, you know, work that I find really interesting around this has come out of Minnesota. Um, and uh, this is a paper that came out in, in 2006 that looked back at outbreaks, salmonella outbreaks in restaurants in Minnesota. And um, of the... Uh, um, 23 restaurant-associated outbreaks in, in Minnesota during, you know, from 95 to 2003. Uh, when the when public health went in and, and requested stool cultures or stool samples so they could culture from um, from food handlers, 64, 53 percent of 121 salmonella positive food workers um, didn't have uh, symptoms, had not reported having a recent uh, gastrointestinal Ill illness. Uh, just an incredible number if we look at this, and I don't know how um, how much this uh, corresponds to the rest of, of the U.S. I don't, you know, as much as Minnesota might think they're very special, I don't think they're all that special. Um, but uh, over half of the individuals that provided stool samples were asymptomatic for salmonella. It's a major concern. And it really shows that, you know, while employee health um, policies matter, you have a, a, a section or you know, a certain uh, size of the workforce that is just carrying pathogens without, um, without any symptoms. And we can see the exact same thing when it comes to norovirus. And I won't focus too much on this slide because it's a little bit messy. What I do want to show is we have two different, um, you know, this is a, a lab controlled um, study, two different groups of people that were positive for human norovirus and they were um, you know, this was to show how much is being shed. But really, you have one post exposure, people that are asymptomatic will be, um, you know, will be shedding the virus in the, you know, seven log uh, area for, you know, 10, 15 days after exposure in, in certain cases. It's different. The one on the right really is about symptoms and and it matters, you know, the, how much of the virus is around in someone's, in someone's system really does depend on, on symptoms. But in this case, we look at salmonella and norovirus as two ex examples. It's not necessary for a food handler to be ill um, to be shedding, you know, virus or, or, or pathogen, bacterial pathogens, really raising the importance of hand washing um, a lot. So what do we do about it? Um, so the, I, I've, I've spent lots and lots of time working with uh, food safety professionals and, you know, sitting at conferences and reading things and almost uh, in a lot of the areas that, that I work in, um, you kind of hear this thing of, well, we could just fix it if we just had more education. And in this case, hand washing is very, very special where the, the rate of understanding around the practice is very high. The knowledge of when to do it is very high. The behavior, though, is uh, is not seen um, all, all that high. And I'll give you an example before I move on to the next slide. If we look at um, the uh, FDA's risk factor uh, study that's run, um, you know, every few years, uh, data was collected in 98, 2003, and 2008. The 2008 data showed that poor personal hygiene is a risk factor, um, especially in food ser full service restaurants. Um, was the you know compliance for personal hygiene was only around uh, 60% with the risk factor, and if you drill that down to to which of you know the factors in personal hygiene, if you look at 
proper and adequate hand washing. Only 24% of the full service restaurants and 61% of the fast food restaurants um, were in compliance with that uh, defined food code, um, you know, hand wash, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's an area that, that obviously we, we need to, to work on. Um, the, the point of the slide that, I, that you have in front of you here with this 3D uh, chart is to show that um, we don't have full, you know, efficiency for hand washing. We'll only see, um, with, if you follow the FDA food code, hand washing, you'll see up to a three log reduction of pathogens, which is, which is great, except if we look at norovirus, for instance, where you only need, on average, 10 norovirus particles in a serving to make somebody sick, removing, um, you know, 99.9% of those, those pathogens or those particles um, could still leave you in, in an event where someone's hands were contaminated with a lot of virus particles. That, coupled with hand washing compliance uh, being, you know, in the, depending on the site, in the 30 or, or 40%, um, you know, maybe in, in other sites up to 60 or 70%, there's a lot of different factors that go into when, you know, how, how much movement we can get, um, you know, in, in making, uh, reducing the public health impact of, of some of these pathogens. So what, you know, what does the food code say? I, you know, I, I um, told our host that I would spend a little bit of time on this. I, I do want to go through a little bit of the science to show you why some of the decisions have been made and where we get, you know, that sort of all these components of um, hand washing and the food cutter are based on some science. Um, you have this rinse step, um, and so you, you need to rinse your hands under clean running water. What this does is it washes off large particles, and it's not really doing a whole lot of, um, of pathogen removal at this point. It's just taking off all the debris that might be on someone's hands as much, you know, as much as possible. Water temperature, you know, it does not matter, uh, in, you know, at least in, in the literature that, that's out there. It doesn't really matter for pathogen remo removal. It can play other roles, especially in this rinse area, can loosen soil. Um, it has been shown to be a preference for, um, you know, certain individuals, although I will highlight that with all the um, focus that we've seen on hand washing in the healthcare um, uh, arena over the last 10 years. There was a study that, that was published um, last week that showed a 450% increase in dermatitis in hospital staff that has been linked, um, you know, uh, directly to increased hand washing since uh, 1996. So if you go back, uh, this is a, a UK study. If you go back and look at um, you know, where we've really focused our areas. It, so, I, you know, I guess the, the reason for me telling you that in, as a, part of this rinse is there are all these, you know, consequences, probably unintended, that factor into compliance. Um, someone who's washing their hands three, four, 12 times a day is at increased risk for um, some pain in their hands. And water temperature um, is, 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 you know, so not washing their hands to because of dermatitis, you know, pops up, but also washing their hands in warm water or cooler water um, really is, is more of a preference uh, situation. We have a soap step. Um, soaps, uh, you know, sort of regardless of composition, make it easier to rinse things off. It will, uh, because of the nature of soap, it allows some of that extra debris that did not come off in, in a rinse to be removed. Um, it has better activity at warmer temperatures um, often, but, and the soap will begin to loosen some of the pathogens that are attached uh, to hands. We have a scrub step. This step really, really matters. Um, this is the mechanical removal of the contaminants and microbes. So the soap may loosen them. You may get a little bit of, uh, of, um, of reduction or removal of pathogens from soap, but really you see um, Usually a one, sometimes depending on how vigorous the rubbing is, the scrubbing is uh, a to two log reduction in pathogens in the scrub step. Um, and it physically gets rid of, um, of these pathogens. And a nail brush really helps. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, it's extremely important to be thorough around fingernails, and, and mainly because that's an area, it's a niche area where um, high amounts of, uh, of organisms, or organisms will harbor the reason being um, that's an area where debris will 
um, will accumulate as well. There's another rinse step. Again, this is really a dilution step. So once the soap has been used, this is rinsing, taking all the pathogens that have been um, scrubbed off and rinsing uh, them away. And again, at the bottom of each of these slides, and there's a reference slide again, is really the work that's been done to show that these steps matter. The last one, the last component that we see in the FDA food code is drying. Um, and in the drying uh, aspect of things, this last step, physically removing microbes and contaminants from hands using a paper towel, using a one-use only towel, will get an extra one log reduction. So any pathogens that work, you know, think of it as you've got your, you're loosening up um, the pathogens and debris. You've got one step where you're doing mechanical removal with the scrubbing. You've got another step of mechanical remo removal with the drawing. Those mechanical removal steps in the literature really, really matter. And um, although it's, it's in the, the food code and, and it's allowable um, using air dryers, there, other than maybe one or two companies, there's not a lot of good validation that those air dryers do remove pathogens at the same level that mechanical drying does. Um, and that's, that's a battle that I think in hand washing we, we wage with our um, you know, folks that, that are looking at sustainability and, and waste, especially around you know, what happens to all those paper towels that have pathogens in it. Um, so if you add all that up, you get proper hand washing with all those steps, you'll get somewhere in the two to three log reduction, depending on the study, depending on where it all kind of, um, you know, uh, comes down and, and the times and some of the, um, you know, the compounds that are used. But that's about as good as you can get. So every time someone washes their hands, you can multiply that, um, that out. So you get this 99 to 99% reduction. Um, the microbial population, just resident microbial population on hand, is often from 40,000 to 4.6 million um, uh, pathogens per square centimeter. So you've got, not pathogens, uh, bacteria. Um, so you've got a lot there, and you're always kind of removing it. And some of that resident population, that's why the dermatitis stuff has popped up, is that that resident population does actually add sort of a protection to your, to your hands. But you could be leaving between you know, uh, 100 and 5,000 microbes behind every time um, hands are, are washed. Um, I'm going to, I've, I've, you know, stolen something with credit from, from my good friend and, um, and, and you know, mentor uh, Pete Snyder on hand washing, the, the guru of, of this stuff. He's, um, you know, focused uh, on the science of hand washing quite a bit, and he recommends uh, something that is compliant with the food code but is not required, the double hand wash with the nail brush, um, which uh, the, the data that he's published shows that you can get up to a six log reduction with this process. And it's really um, throwing in a nail brush in the middle and then in two soap steps. And if I was um, running a food company, this is what I would do. Um, this is the hand washing, although it's more than, you know, being more than compliant with uh, the food code, this is where I would go. So let's talk about compliance. Um, I already mentioned the FDA um, risk factor study. We see some other uh, studies out there that look at different levels of compliance. Um, you know, one of my favorite uh, um, pictures here on employees must, quote, wash hands, which someone in the meme world has said, those are suspicious quotation marks. Um, we, we know that, um, you know, that, that people don't do it all the time. Uh, one study showed 73% of restaurant workers failed to use the proper hand washing. Other studies have found about 30% uh, 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 compliance. I mean, 30, 40%, 25%, whatever. It's not high, um, and that that's kind of we know we know that. Why is that? And there has been some work that's been done on this. Um, you know, we've done some observation work. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you that some of the, the stuff that we did in, in kitchens where we put up video cameras, we saw hand washing compliance um, much, much lower at busy times during the workday. Not revolutionary by any means, but the data definitely shows that, that if you're likely to get a hand washing violation, if you're likely to pass on a pathogen due to hand washing, it's go going to be at a time when things are really, really busy. Um, 
sometimes we've seen that uh, hand washing compliance is low because gloves are being worn and they're used as a false sense of security. Um, we've seen from uh, from a meta-analysis of um, hand washing violations that not having the tools, so no no or too few hand washing stations or no soap uh, are a factor, poor locations enhancing. Um, and then we get into the, the, I guess, cultural value side of things where there's uh, often, uh, in certain cases, a lack of values over the practice. So like I mentioned before, that people know that they should do it, they know when they should do it, they know how to do it, but the organization doesn't value hand washing at the right times. Um, or there's a lack of knowledge of the consequences. So that, yeah, hand washing is really important, but no one's really gotten sick. Um, not, you know, that, that's a, an attitude that, that you sometimes see uh, within the industry with food handlers and not knowing, not being able to sort of show that, you know, really bad hand washing has led to some of the issues that I had talked about before. And, you know, I only had 35, 40 minutes to talk about this today. There's about 400 outbreaks that we can link back to uh, improper hand washing at food service. So what do we, what do, we do about it? Um, I guess this is an area that um, our, our colleagues in uh, healthcare and in hospitals are a little more advanced than we are. And um, there's a, a really fantastic paper, I've included the reference at the bottom here, um, that came out in 2010 that looked at um, about 85 hand washing compliance um, uh, programs in healthcare and found these common trends that matter. If you reinforced hand hygiene messages personally, not with um, messages on, uh, you know, in hand washing boards, but a personal connection with somebody reinforcing uh, positively that, that it matters and how people are doing it, providing that feedback, as well as creating some sort of uh, competition around hand washing, that matters. Um, Knowledge of healthcare workers' perceived importance of hand hygiene and its role in prevention. So um, this comes back to, to the situation I talked about before is not just knowing, you know, asking people when they, you know, if they know when to do it, but really whether they think that they're doing anything. And our behavioral models out there dictate that that really does matter. Uh, monitoring and feedback of hand hygiene pr uh, practices. So being able to uh, to know, to be able to count, to have some sort of prevalence of compliance. Uh, providing practical educational tools, role modeling by senior staff, and having a supportive infrastructure for management. So that role modeling, I'll talk about that here for a second. That's having managers and having ownership and having anyone who's coming in from a corporate area really demonstrate when they are there that that hand washing matters, and then having all the tools and supportive resources from management. So when soap runs out or when paper towels run out, not that, oh, yeah, we'll get to that tomorrow, but that is a priority. Um, being able to place a value from a management system really, really matters. So how else do we do it, and how do we bring this to our to the food level? Well, evaluating food preparation activities and the frequency of needed hand washing matters, having a sense of, of, of when it's important within your specific system and picking out the ones that are the most important to put your resources behind. Um, ensuring shifts are staffed appropriately to handle the workload, again, from some of our work, uh, showing that busyness really, really matters. And in our case, we worked with one um, food service company who, who changed some of their staffing patterns based on the data that we showed them on cross-contamination and hand washing by saying, well, we clearly need to, we're, we're doing things that are risky here, and if we can stagger our workforce differently within our system, we may be able to uh, take some of that busyness off of our, um, our line staff. Um, providing multiple hand sinks for workers that are well stocked with soap and paper towels. Hand sinks should be in, uh, in the workspace, in worker site while they're working. Again, that peer aspect of things. Uh, creating this value system where this is what we do and this is when we do it. And it needs to be convenient, and everyone's got to be able to see it. Um, the food safety training is crucial from a knowledge standpoint, but one-time training is only marginally effective. The ongoing reminders, keeping it fresh. And, and I, you know, I wouldn't show you um, a picture of a hand washing sign here. I show you a picture of having someone who is there actively reminding people and reinforcing and providing feedback matters. Um, 
those are the things that, that you know that typically pop up uh, when it comes to addressing it. I do want to talk about and you know mainly to head off some of the questions that that, that probably come up. Um, aspects around hand sanitizers um, and. Uh, I think, you know, I have a colleague, Don Schaffner, who, who I work with quite a bit, um, and I agree with, with a lot of what Don focuses on when it comes to hand washing and hand sanitizers, that the way that we regulate sanitizers is a little bit outdated, and they do serve a really nice public health um, niche, but you have to understand what you're using them for and how you're using them. And so um, for most pathogens, a hand sanitizer with an alcohol concentration um, the alcohol concentration needs to be at least 60 percent to do anything uh, for the pathogens, and, and that's largely we go to this next slide about um, bacterial you know pathogens because the sanitizers, most hand sanitizer that's out there that's commercially available, is not effective for all of the pathogens or agents of disease, especially norovirus. And so there are some products that are available on uh, on the market um, that that do have. Um, uh, that are effective, but uh, and you can you can search that out in the reference that, that I've got here. Um, but it's not something, and you know, we just went through a norovirus outbreak here on campus at NC State. It's one of the things where you see this increased use of hand sanitizer within the general population, and really in that outbreak situation, the stuff that people are going to get at CVS or Walgreens really isn't going to do a whole lot uh, to to control for for noro. So. You know, the, there's no hand hand washing um, uh, uh, talk for me that's complete without discussing a little bit about sanitizers. That that they do have a public health um, uh, role. That that in certain cases they they can uh, um, absolutely reduce uh, pathogen load even on dirty hands. But um, but but they're not a sort of save all uh, for everything. Um, so I guess key, key takeaways for me to for you for improving compliance, really teaching staff on why they should care, and why hand washing is so important, um, ensuring that they have the right reference material, the right tools for proper practice, and providing regular and frequent reminders and feedback around hand, hand washing. I would say that we are too often relying on I'm going to train you for 15 minutes on how to do to wash hands, and we're not. Uh, our compliance issues are really. Um, uh, there because we've, we've not done a really good job explaining the why and the how of hand washing and providing the importance. Um, I will end on this slide and, uh, and take some, some questions. I think we have some time. Um, the, the last thing I just want to tell you is um, this is a picture that came from one of our rival universities, from Duke University, um, at the height of a norovirus outbreak a couple of years ago uh, where, where they were they're very concerned, and as, as, as we all are, about water usage, but not getting the science right, um, you know, by saying use instant hand sanitizer, no rinse required, uh, helping us save water is not the greatest way uh, to control um, a norovirus pathogen once it's in a dormitory setting. Um, but, um, you know, so, so it's getting the science right as well as having those positive reinforcements um, really matters. There's my uh, contact information. Um, you know, feel free to uh, to call or email if you have any any questions that, that we can't get to in the next ten minutes here. Uh, but but with that, I'm uh, I've completed my program and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Ben. We do have a couple questions on the line that we'll get started with. Um, first up. You mentioned a study published last week that indicated there was a significant increase in dermatitis in healthcare workers since 1996. Did the study consider the use of hand antiseptics or hand sanitizers as part of the cause? Yeah, great, great question. The study included um, both of those things. So it was, and it, you know, healthcare is a little different from from what we experience in in food service and in you know in, in food processing or whatever it is where um, there. In in that setting, there is a lot of the hand washing step is quite a bit longer um, from a standard operating procedure standpoint. Plus, there's almost always a post um, sanitizer use, um, so that really um, can impact that resident uh, bacteria that we talked about, that I talked about in, in my in my talk. I, you know, so I don't think it is. Um, it's not a. Um, uh, 
it, it, it's not a paper that sort of says we we're, we're really impacting hand washing and food service because that's not been done. But it does show us why people may not want to wash their hands so much because there might be some increased um, dermatitis issues even within our within our system. So it's important to like I would say from a resource standpoint, it's important to also let people know about um, moisturizers or provide compounds that, are, that also provide some moisturizing uh, uh, component uh, to it. But yes, to, to the you know, basic part of the question, is both um, hand washing and sanitizer use. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a couple of questions on nail brushes. Um, number one, how often do they need to be replaced? Number two, how are they kept clean? And number three, does each employee need their own nail brush? Oh, good questions on nail brushes. Um, I, I'll look to, um, to Pete Snyder's work on that. Um, it's really hard to answer the question of how long you can keep them for. Um, it depends, I, I, I would say, on the quality of the brush and uh, what the brush components are. Um, the, the, the ones that, um, let me pull Pete's work up here. Um, the, the ones that, that, that Pete has sort of uh, talked about the most um, really uh, look at, um, you know, uh, durable, uh, you know, plastic type nail brushes. And um, it, so it depends, I guess. Um, uh, the question on how do you keep them clean, um, he suggested uh, being able to, to throw um, those nail brushes into sanitizer buckets similar to, to what we do with utensils uh, and then pull those out uh, when, when needed. And so those sanitizers have, those sanitizer buckets have a dilution um, effect as well as some sanitizer uh, action. And I'll get to that third question on does each individual person need their own nail brush or not? I would say if you're, if you're using a sanitizer bucket strategy, then, then no. Um, that would that would not be uh, that would not be needed. And there's um, there's a really good um, uh, program that, that Pete has on his uh, on his website. It's uh, it's for those who are out there with the interwebs, and you can write this down. It's h i dash t m dot com, and he has a um, a reference called a Safe Hands Wash Program for Retail Food Operations, a technical review. It's it's old. I mean, not like dated old. It's from the late 90s. But but Pete really breaks down all the different components with reference on on why um, nail brushes matter. And I'm a I'm a fan of of what he uh, what he puts out. All right, next question. Do you know of any recent third-party studies that show an alternative method of cleansing the hands that is equivalent to the food code hand-washing requirements? Is, that's, a, that's a tough question. It, it might be a sanitizer question, if I'm reading it correctly. Um, so I guess the Liu, um, UN, Sal, Jacobs, and Mo reference is from a paper of the Canada in 2010 that talked about hand sanitizer effectiveness when it comes to norovirus. I'm not aware of anything that says, um, an, uh, so that one is specific to one specific pathogen. Um, Don Schaffner also has some work that has looked at um, modeling hand sanitizer use uh, in, with dirty hands in certain environments. Um, that's also really, really good. There's not one that kind of pulls it all together and says, Here, here's an alternative step to the FDA food code that would be um, uh, sort of step-by-step uh, step goes, goes down. I think there are, there are probably three or four papers out there um, that give components for specific pathogens. Um, can you comment back on differences between liquids, uh, foam, and bar soap? I, you know, I can't. Um, that's really not my area. Sorry to, to drop the ball on, on that question. I don't know, um, you know, the, the difference or if there has been every, any difference in the, the literature that I've seen around soap as a, um, you know, being used. It's not really um, made a lot of um, 
uh, distinction between those those two. Uh, I would say that the um, there had been some some concern, you know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago about bar soap, uh, especially bar soap as uh, if it was really dirty, providing a protective niche for um, bacteria to grow. I don't know. I don't think the literature is really great on whether that matters from a pathogen standpoint. Um, so, so I would say, to me, I look at this stuff as, you know, soap matters. There may be some differences around different types of soap, but it's not something that I've, I've jumped into um, too much on my own. And there's probably a bunch of people on this call that can answer that question better than I can. All right, uh, next question. What can you say about hand swab testing for total plate count or the ATP test to verify effectiveness of hand washing? Well, hand swabbing uh, or total plate count, um, I mean, all three of those um, those examples, if we go back to, I'll, let me shoot back to um, my slide of the hand washing, we know that there's a whole bunch of resident pathogens or resident bacteria on hand. With hand washing, we only really expect to see a three log reduction. Um, it, it would, ATP, for instance, would be, I mean, it, you have ATP in all the cells on your hands. It would be a very poor um, uh, uh, indicator, from, from what I understand, of um, sanitizer on hands because you expect it's, it's lit, your hands have ATP. Um, I, I would say that. Um, if you were looking at swabbing and looking for specific pathogens or specific indicator organisms as opposed to, um, uh, you know, plate count, that would be more effective. Uh, but then what you have to do is assume or load those hands with those indicator organisms in the, in the first place. So, and that's really, I mean, if we look at how um, – you know, compounds are, are evaluated for regulatory claims. That's what happens is you have a known amount of a pathogen or a panel of pathogens, and you put those on hands, and then you look at uh, what the efficacy is of the uh, of the compound. So I, I would say for hands, you've got a lot of, you know, we expect to see microorganisms there, and we expect that there would be ATP. All right, last question for today. What other research gaps are you looking at? Um, relating to, to hand washing, um, one of the things that, that um, we've been looking at in the last little while are, um, you know, I do a lot of work with sort of niche kind of areas, and we spent a lot of time with farmers markets over the last couple of years looking at mobile hand washing units. Um, sort of your non-traditional settings and how do you get people to wash their hands in those settings and then hold, um, you know, that, that water because you can't dispose of it um, just on the ground. So we're looking at sort of the efficacy of, of those uh, types of systems. Um, and we're also looking at, um, you know, from a consumer side of things, uh, hand washing um, practices in the home and how those might uh, differ or are similar to other uh, hand washing um, behaviors out there, uh, but we do a lot of other stuff around communication uh, interventions and food safety culture stuff. But those are the hand washing specific things that we have going on. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, I think we'll end the webcast for today. A couple last notes at the end of the presentation. There will be a recording of the presentation available on Friday, February 20th at www.ecolab.com slash media center presentations, um, if you check that out on February 20th. Uh, remember, the food safety webinars are on the third Tuesday of every month. The next one will be on March 17th at 1 p.m. Uh, it will be entitled Floors and Drains, Do You Know What You're Walking On?, presented by Stacey Fabush. And a reminder, please answer the survey following today's webinar. This is also where you can request your continuing education certificate. Thank you for joining us today.